subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified Supplement where we discussed the Hindu newspaper of New Delhi edition of the last Sunday that is the newspaper dated 21st November 2021 and the important news appearing in the explained section of Indian Express in the last week of November. Now these are the list of news which we will be taking up for our today's discussion and the time stamping for these has been provided in the YouTube description. So on this note let's start the discussion with respect to these news appearing in the Hindu newspaper and Indian Express explained section. Now let's take up our first news appearing in the FAQ section in the Hindu newspaper. Now this news says why is India's coal usage under scrutiny. Now the whole issue which has been highlighted in this article is regarding the term which has been used in the Glasgow conference referred as phasing down of coal rather than phasing out of coal. Now there is a difference between these two terms as India has chosen not this term that is phase out of coal but has rather chosen this term that is phasing down of coal. So this has created certain discontent among the developed world. Now the term phase out of coal simply means putting a complete end on the use of coal. Now this is not possible considering India's national circumstances especially with respect to India's energy needs as highlighted by Indian officials as they have said that in light of India's national circumstances, India does agree to phase down of coal which means reducing the proportion of coal in India's energy mix as compared to non-fossil renewable energy. So here it highlights that the term phase out of coal would mean putting a complete stop on coal while phase down would mean the proportion of coal in total energy would reduce. Now the officials also highlighted that India as of now is a developing country so phasing out of coal is out of the question and here the term phase down was highlighted in the Glasgow conference in the sense that percentage of coal in the overall mix of India's energy need will go down. But the absolute use of coal in terms of power generation and other industrial activity especially relating to infrastructure may rise. So based on this understanding, let's also go through some of the other important highlights of this particular article. Now this news becomes important mainly from our mains perspective under GS paper 3, both from the perspective of economic development and also environment. Now other than this issue of phasing out of coal, other issues are also raised in this article. Now the moment India along with the developing countries chose to use the term phasing down of coal that is reducing the proportion of use of coal slowly question on India's commitment on climate change arose that too by the developed world and they said that India need to reduce its dependence on coal. Now having said that we should not forget the differences not only in terms of per capita emission of a developed country and a developing country but also the historical accountability of a developed world especially with respect to per capita emissions and also the fact that developed world has shied away from providing financial help to the developing countries so that they can take appropriate steps to reduce their dependence on coal. Now coal is a very cheap source of energy and hence is used in various industrial activities. So this can be said to be a rather unfair expectation by the developed countries from the developing world without providing any financial or technical assistance or without committing to take any action to reduce global emissions. Now despite using the term phasing down of coal, India has promised to increase its capacity with respect to non-fossil fuel to 500 gigawatts by the year 2030. And India has also said that it will try to meet 50% of its energy needs from renewable sources. However, this is also dependent on financial and other technical help which must be provided by the developed countries. And also India has said that it will try to reduce carbon emission by 1 billion tons which also means that India will reduce its carbon output by almost 22%. Now there may be certain problems in achieving these targets nevertheless India has definitely promised to achieve these targets and reduce its dependence on coal 
and simultaneously increase the use of non-fossil renewable energy. Now, according to the Economic Survey of 2021-22, it highlights about the use of coal for Indian industrial needs. So, it says that coal accounts for 55% of India's energy needs. Coal is used as primary and intermediary source of energy for different sectors such as thermal plant, electricity, brick kilns, etc. Now, for the financial year 2020, production of raw coal in India was approximately 729.1 million tons and also the fact that India imports coal in order to meet the demand of energy in India. So, in the financial year 2020, India imported roughly around 248.54 million tons as per the economic survey of 2021-22. Now, both these graph highlights about coal production in India from 2016 to 2020 and also the demand supply gap with respect to production of coal and the fact that some of the demand for coal is fulfilled by import. And as you can see, for the financial year 2020, the import was slightly more as compared to the previous years. And this was also because of lack of production of coal due to COVID-19. Now coming down to the aspect of carbon emissions per capita, according to a 2018 World Bank data, the per capita emission for India was 1.8 metric ton, whereas for United States was 15.2 metric tons. So as we can see, there is a huge gap of even per capita emission between the developed and the developing countries. So we can say that India's commitment of phasing down the use of coal, that is reducing the use of coal in its energy mix, is based on India's historic per capita emission, which has been very low, and also India's developmental needs, which has been described by Indian officials as India's national circumstances. Further. India's commitment to phase down coal will also be dependent on financial and technological help provided by the developed world, acknowledgement of historical emissions done by the developed world, and also the fact that focus should not only be on the use of this fossil fuel namely coal, but also the use of other fossil fuel namely oil and natural gas which is significantly used by the developed world. So in the name of coal, developing countries should not be made scapegoat as the developed world also uses the fossil fuel namely oil and natural gas. So phasing down on the use of oil and natural gas must also be committed by the developed world. Thus this article becomes important mainly from the mains perspective under GS paper 3, both from the perspective of Indian economic development and also environmental pollution. The next news has also been taken up from the Hindu newspaper appearing on page number 8. It says, study reveals pollution in water bodies around thermal power plant. It finds surface and ground water contaminated with toxic metals. Now this news highlights about two thermal power plants just outside the city of Nagpur in Maharashtra and has highlighted that because of this thermal power plant, ground water has been contaminated with toxic elements. Further, it also mentions about widespread contamination of air and also land, especially soils, by fly ash, which is a byproduct of thermal power plants. So this topic becomes important both from the prelims and mains perspective under GS paper 3 with respect to economic development and environment and environmental pollution. Now, as you can see, a question was also asked in 2014 in GS paper 3. The question was, environmental impact assessment studies are increasingly undertaken before a project is cleared by the government. Discuss the environmental impacts of coal-fired thermal plants located at pit heads. This question carried 12.5 marks and has to be written within 200 words. Further, let's see this question asked in 2013 in the prelims examination. The question was, which of the following can be found as pollutants in drinking water in some parts of India? Options were arsenic, sorbitol, fluoride, formaldehyde and uranium. Further, questions were also asked in the prelims examination with respect to fly ash. So regarding fly ash, it's a byproduct of coal-based thermal power plants and its various components include silicon dioxide, ferric oxide, aluminium oxide and calcium oxide occasionally. Further, fly ash is also used as construction material for roads, embankments, flyover, bridges, etc. 
So this question asked in 2015 was with reference to fly ash produced by power plants using coal as fuel, which of the following statements is are correct? Options are first, fly ash can be used in the production of bricks for building construction. Yes, this is correct. Second, fly ash can be used as a replacement for some of the Portland cement contents of concrete. Yes, this is also correct. Third, fly ash is made up of silicon dioxide and calcium oxide only. Now, as we can see that fly ash is made up of silicon dioxide, ferric oxide, aluminium oxide and also occasionally calcium oxide. Hence, this statement becomes incorrect. So the question was select the correct answer using the code given below. So here the correct answer was A that is 1 and 2. Now, before taking up this question, let's go through the highlights of this particular news. So this news with respect to Koradi and Khapar Khera thermal power stations, it highlights about the rampant pollution which has been caused by it. So this report highlights about discharges of untreated water directly into Nalas, high levels of noise pollution and also high levels of sulfur dioxide and particulate matter emissions, fly ash discharges into local rivers and streams, fly ash being blown in the wind causing intense dust pollution, fly ash deposition on crops, horticulture and vegetable, severely impacts the yields and overall income of farmers. Further, it also mentions about severe health impacts of this pollution with respect to contaminated water and also fly ash like widespread respiratory ailments, asthma, etc. So regarding the findings of this particular survey around the water bodies of this power plant, it highlights that water samples were collected from 25 locations including subsurface and groundwater and also treatment facilities. Further, it says that the study found surface and groundwater contamination with toxic metals such as mercury, arsenic, aluminium, lithium, etc. which exceeds the safe limit by 10 to 15 times. The study also mentions about widespread contamination of air, water and soil pollution due to fly ash. So based on these reports, this study has suggested immediate halt on discharge of toxic pollutants in the water and also immediate halt on discharge of fly ash in water and land in time bound manner. Further, the report has suggested for cleaning up pollution under the supervision of a commission which should comprise of the local community that is the local people living around the area civil society members and also independent experts. Further, this report says that Ministry of Environment must take strict precautionary measures and can also suspend the use of thermal power plant if pollution persists as this pollution is also impacting the health of people living around the power plant. Now earlier, the Ministry of Environment had allowed for installation of new units to these power plants. So the report suggests that these new installation of the units which will increase the load of this thermal power plant, which will overall increase the environmental pollution with respect to fly ash and contamination of water must be put on hold. And lastly, the report has also suggested that the thermal power plant must find ways to ensure 100% utilization of fly ash. That is, they must find a way to collect these fly ash and sell them for their appropriate use. So we understand that operation of a thermal power plant results in various kinds of pollution namely water pollution, air pollution and also impacts the use of land. So during the construction of thermal power plants, we see a loss of biodiversity, we notice loss or change of soil quality and quantity. There are also instances of diversion and acquisition of land in case of power plant with captive mining and there are also increased instances of dust pollution because of fly ash and also of noise pollution because of operation of the thermal power plant. Now regarding environmental impact during the operational stage, there are obviously air pollution with respect to fly ash and other toxic gases released by the thermal power plant, waste generation, water consumption as these thermal power plant utilizes a lot of water, mercury emission becomes another set of problem and also greenhouse gas emissions. Now regarding air pollution due to thermal power plants, there are two aspects. First is air pollution from point source and second is air pollution from non-point source. So from the point source, air pollution includes pollution of particulate matters, gaseous emissions such as sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen, 
carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and hydrocarbon. So these are the examples of air pollution which results in the operation of such thermal power plants. And air pollution from non-point source includes or happens during the transportation of coal, loading or unloading of fuel, storing of coal, handling and transportation of fly ash and also coal storage yard. So all these can be said to be the reasons for air pollution from non-point source. So it is in this regard that environmental impact assessment is necessary before installation of these thermal power plants. Now let's go through this question asked by UPSC in 2020. It says consider the following statements. First, coal ash contains arsenic, lead and mercury. This is correct. Second, coal fired power plants release sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen into the environment. Yes, this is also correct as we have just seen. And third, high ash content is observed in Indian coal. This is also correct. So the question was, which of the statements given above is our correct? So here the correct answer becomes D, that is 1, 2 and 3. Now coming to the answer of question asked by UPSC in 2013, the question was, which of the following can be found as pollutants in the drinking water in some parts of India? Here the correct options are first, third and fifth. As sorbitol and formaldehyde are not found as pollutants in drinking water. So here the correct answer becomes C, that is 1, 3 and 5 only. Thus this topic becomes important both from our prelims and mains perspective and questions has been asked previously by UPSC in both prelims and mains. Now let's take up the news from the section of Indian Express explained. Now this news says that how climate change causes divorce among albatrosses. It says that how exactly can a changing environment cause these birds to split up? A new study has provided evidence of the effect of environmental conditions on the longevity of their relationships among a population of albatrosses. Now this albatrosses is black-browed albatross. Now this news highlights about their split because of breeding failure which is basically an adaptive strategy to sustain environmental harshness because of increasing climate change. Now these black-browed albatrosses are mostly found along Falkland Islands around the South Atlantic Ocean. However, this report highlights about breeding failure resulting in their splits. Further, the IUCN status of black browed albatross is least concerned. However, there are other kind of albatross whose IUCN status are a bit different from black browed albatross. For example, Northern Royal Albatross. Now their population is also decreasing and it has been categorized as endangered as per IUCN. Further, Sooty albatross has also been declared as endangered as per IUCN and the wandering albatross has also been declared as vulnerable as per IUCN. And the areas are almost similar with respect to all these albatrosses. So please remember this news from your prelims perspective from the fact that there has been a breeding failure among the species of black proud albatross which has been categorized as least concerned as per IUCN status. Now the next news taken up from the explained section of Indian Express is about the James Webb Space Telescope as this telescope will not only replace Hubble but will also explore various aspects of space including evolution of solar system and also about Big Bang. So this topic becomes important mainly from your prelims perspective under the section of general science. So this telescope is a result of an international collaboration between NASA of United States, European Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency. So you must remember these points from your prelims perspective. It further says that this telescope will be launched on an Ariane 5 ECA rocket from French Guiana in South America. And this rocket is being contributed by the ESA, that is European Space Agency. Now regarding certain important information about this telescope, it is a large infrared telescope which will study every phase in the history of the universe. And these phases includes the Big Bang, formation of solar systems that are capable of supporting life on other planets and also about the evolution of our own solar system. And as already stated that this telescope is considered as a successor of the Hubble telescope and will extend and complement its discoveries. Now the four central goals or the four main goals of James Webb Space Telescope are first to search for the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang 
as it will help us to find out about the expansion of the universe. Further, to determine how galaxies evolved from their earlier formation until now. Third, to observe the formation of stars from the first stages to the formation of planetary systems. So from the formation of stars till the formation of planetary system. And finally, to measure the physical and chemical properties of planetary systems and investigate the potential for life in such system. So these can be said to be the four central goals of James Webb Space Telescope. Now some of the other important highlights of James Webb Telescope includes it has a mirror which is comprised of 18 gold plated hexagonal deployment segments. Now this telescope has four science instruments namely the near infrared camera, near infrared spectrograph, mid infrared instrument and near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph with fine guidance sensors. So these are the instruments of James Webb telescope. Now regarding the wavelengths which it can monitor are visible wavelength, near infrared wavelengths and mid infrared wavelengths. Now the infrared wavelengths can be categorized as near infrared wavelength, mid infrared wavelength and far infrared wavelength. Now the near infrared wavelengths can be measured from the earth with special instruments or with special detectors. However, the mid infrared and far infrared wavelengths can only be observed or measured above the earth's atmosphere that is from the space. And this is where the James Webb Space Telescope will measure the mid infrared wavelength as well. Now regarding the travel distance, it says that it will travel 1.5 million kilometers from earth and it will orbit the sun around the second Langridge point. Let's understand this aspect. Now as you can see in this particular map, these are the five Langridge points. Now these Langridge points are positions in the space where the gravitational force of two body system. Now here the first body is the sun and the second body is the earth. So it says that in space where the gravitational forces of two body system namely the sun and the earth produce enhanced regions of attraction and repulsion. Now these Langridge points are positions where the gravitational pull of two large masses precisely equals the centripetal force required for a small object to move with them. So the James Webb Space Telescope will be placed here at L2. So it highlights that L2 is ideal for astronomy because a spacecraft is close enough to readily communicate with the earth can keep the sun, earth and the moon behind the spacecraft for solar power and this position also provides a clear view of deep space for our telescopes. So that is why the James Webb Space Telescope will be placed at L2 that is Langridge point 2. So the fact highlights that the James Webb Telescope will orbit the sun around the second Langridge point. So all this information becomes important mainly from your prelims perspective under the aspect of general science. The last news to be taken up for discussion also appears in the explained section. It says, can elephant collaring help manage human elephant conflict in Assam? Assam's forest department is planning to collar at least five elephants in the high conflict habitats in the coming months. So in this regard, this news highlights about radio collaring and also the challenges involved with respect to collaring these elephants. Now, Assam Forest Department along with World Wildlife Fund, which is an NGO, plans to collar at least five elephant. Now, these are GPS enabled collars and it helps to track the movement of these elephants. So, the overall objective of radio collaring is to track the movement of the elephant herds and also to identify their pattern of movement across a particular region or habitat. Now the tracking of movement and also identification of the pattern of movement across regions and habitats will help to mitigate risk especially for those villagers and people who generally have to face the brunt of human elephant conflict. So the whole idea is to reduce conflict through prior information which can be made available through these GPS enabled collars which the Assam Forest Department and World Wildlife Fund which is an NGO plans to radio collar on the five elephants in, in high conflict habitats. So as already stated that these radio collars are GPS enabled collars that can relay information about an elephant's whereabouts. 
Now these radio collars weigh around 8 kg and are fitted around the elephant's neck as you can see in this particular photo. Further it says that the team also attaches an accelerometer to the collar to understand what exactly an elephant is doing at a given point of time, namely whether they are running or whether they are walking or even whether they are eating or drinking water. So all these activities will not only help to track their movement but also identify the pattern of their behavior along with movement in certain habitats. Now regarding the objectives of radio collaring it says information from these radio collars help to track and study the movement patterns of the herd across regions and habitats and the collars also serve as an early warning system so it helps in a way that if people know in which direction the elephant is moving then they can prepare accordingly. And even the officials and villagers can be informed about such movement of elephants and overall this will help in mitigating conflict. That is it will help to reduce human elephant conflict. So this is the whole idea behind radio collaring of the elephants. However this entire process is not that easy and there are certain practical and operational challenges also. So the challenges include identifying the matriarch of the herd is a time taking process and at times the forest officials have to follow these herd. Now this itself is a very risky process as even the life of forest officials are at risk. So it says that tracing the elephants on foot for sedating purposes is dangerous for the officials. So these officials follow these elephants at times for number of days and then they try to sedate these elephants so that these elephants can be radio collared. So it says that the exercise is challenging and even run the risk of having a low success rate because tracing these elephants is not easy. It further says that collaring includes identifying a suitable candidate, generally an adult elephant, darting it with a sedative and fitting a collar around elephant's neck before the animal is revived. So this again becomes a very difficult task. Now another set of challenge is that all components of this radio collar are not available in India including collars and also tranquilizing drugs and the drugs along with the collars have to be imported and are very expensive. Another set of challenge highlighted in this article is that the growth of elephants must also be taken into mind while collaring them with GPS device as it might become very tight at times. So even considering the life and health of elephant is very important. Now another challenge is regarding Assam's topography especially with respect to various hills and rivers including Brahmaputra which runs across Assam. So tracking these elephants and their herds across these difficult regions also becomes an operational challenge especially with respect to the purpose of sedating. Now another challenge highlighted is that at times the radio collar falls off or there can be technical glitches because of which the radio collar does not work. So collar falling off or the device not working becomes another set of challenge for the officials especially with respect to tracking these elephants and their herds. Thus this topic becomes important mainly from the perspective of GS paper 3 under the aspect of technology and biodiversity and also question can be asked in the prelims examination especially from the perspective of environment and also general science. With this let's take up the question for the day. Now based on our discussion this becomes your practice question for the day. The question is consider the following statements. First the Langridge points are positions where the gravitational pull of two large masses precisely equals the centripetal force required for a small object to move with them. Second James Webb Space Telescope will be placed around the second Langridge point. And third James Webb Space Telescope is the result of an international collaboration between NASA, ESA and JAXA. So the question is which of the statements given above is are correct. Options are A 1 and 3 only, B 1 and 2 only, C 2 and 3 only and D none of the above. Now coming to the answer of yesterday the question was about Omicron. A recent SARS-CoV-2 variant seen in news was first reported in which of the following country. In this the correct answer was A that is South Africa. The other options were Kenya, Egypt and Libya. So the solution says that the WHO has classified B1.1.529 variant referred as Omicron which was detected in South Africa as a SARS-CoV-2 variant of concern saying that it may spread more quickly than other forms of virus. So with this we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you for watching DNS Supplement.